So welcome to the virtual Mark Twain Library. I'm Elaine Sanders, the Library's Adult Programming Coordinator, and I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. Um, we're welcoming Walter Woodward. Walter is Connecticut State Historian and Associate Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. So and tonight we're going to get a glimpse into his latest book, Creating Connecticut, Critical Moments That Shaped a Great State. Walter is a scholar of early American and Atlantic world history with an emphasis on Connecticut and New England. His research interests cover a variety of subjects, including witchcraft, alchemy, and the history of science, the use of music in early America, and environmental history. Walter is also the narrator and producer of Today in Connecticut History with Connecticut Humanities and Grading the Nutmeg, the podcast of Connecticut History with Connecticut Explored Magazine. He also writes the From the State Historian column in Connecticut Explored. So before I turn the evening over to Walter, please know that we have reserved time for questions at the end of the program. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat function at any time. And you can find the button for this feature on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are also recording tonight's program. So please let your friends and neighbors know that they're, if they're not here with us tonight, that the recording of the program will be available to view on the library's YouTube channel in a few days. So now I'd like to turn the evening over to Walter. Walter, thank you so much for being with us. We're delighted to have you. Thank you, Elaine. It's, it's, it's great to be here virtually, and I thank you all for coming out after this very hot and hopefully not too stormy ahead of us uh, day. Uh, I. I am very excited to talk about this book, Creating Connecticut. It is my, uh, it's my fifth book, my fourth history book. And of all the books I've written, this is the one that I think I lavish the most care and attention in, in crafting because I wanted it to do certain things. And, and when I got the book done, I spent a fair amount of time thinking, how am I going to introduce this book to people so that they understand why, uh, why it is structured and presented the way it is? And I thought back, I kept coming back to my very first class as a graduate student many, many years ago when you know I'm, I'm just getting ready to, it's my first dive into becoming a professional historian. I'm so excited. My first class was with a very dour but brilliant uh, distinguished university professor. professor. That's, a, that's the highest honor that the University of Connecticut can give. And this distinguished professor named Richard D. Brown. And I remember going into his class, first day as a graduate student, excited with my colleagues, sitting down in the chair around the seminar table and just you know, straining with every nerve, ready to answer any question he could ask of me because I read the book, I was prepared. And he looked at us and he said, why did the author write this book? And I was nonplussed because of all the questions I had thought he might ask, that one never even crossed my mind. But for the next three hour, hours, he and uh, myself and my new colleagues we spent our time answering that question and going back and forth and trying to puzzle out why the author wrote the book. And we did the same thing every week for the next 15 weeks. And by the time that semester was over, I realized just how important that question, why did the author write this book, is. The th when you think about it, what, what is it that makes an author think that the, the thing they're writing about is so important that it's worth several years of his or her life to get down on paper. And then why is he or she so brash as to think that uh, it's worth a week or two or more or several days anyway of your time to read it? Well, I still think that's a profoundly important question. So when I thought about interesting, uh, introducing the book, I decided at the end that that was how I was going to introduce it. So with your permission, I'm going to begin now and answer that most important question, why I wrote this book. As Connecticut State historian, 
I've had the good fortune to spend my career focusing my historical research on this state, its people, and their stories. Creating Connecticut is a product of that effort. It's a collection of 24 stories, 12 shorter, 12 longer, each of which tells us something important about Connecticut's past, something that still, in one way or another, affects our lives as Connecticut's today. All of them are designed to be readable, engaging, and informative introductions to aspects of our state's history that will be new, or nearly so, to most readers. Some of the stories in Creating Connecticut show people we thought we knew, Mark Twain, Nathan Hale, in new and surprising ways. Some tell us about people many of us don't know, Eliezer Wheelock, Samson Ockham, Adrian Block, but perhaps we ought to. And many are about events, movements, and periods of change, the Pequot War, the Hartford Witch Hunt, out-migration to Connecticut's Western Reserve, Irish immigration into the state, crucial moments when Connecticut's were tested and called on by circumstances to change their minds, their values, their approaches, and even lives, times just like the year we have just lived through. And some of the stories are about the uniqueness of our state and the ways in which Connecticut's have celebrated their past in the past. The focus here is on stories that both interest and matter. You can read them from front to back. They're arranged more or less in chronological order. Or you can scan the table of contents and just jump in with the story that seems most interesting to you. But my hope, and the reason I wrote this book, is that as you read, you'll find them all interesting and come away with the desire to know more about Connecticut history. So, now you know why I wrote this book. And what I'd like to do with the rest of my talk is read passages from a few of the stories in Creating Connecticut, then answer any questions you may have, and finally tell you several ways that you can get access to uh, this, what my wife calls this rare literary gem, which is why perhaps, not perhaps at all, which is why she's my wife. And I'll begin with a reading from Creating Connecticut's first story about Connecticut's restless beginnings and the 50 years of conflict between the Dutch and the English and the indigenous people of this state, a restless era that is today an all but forgotten part of our history. That story begins on a day in April in the year 1614. In the spring of 1614, Adrian Block sailed the little ship he had built and named Onrust, Restlessness, into the river the Algonquians called Connecticut, or the place of the long water. The 47-year-old Dutchman was as restless as his vessel and anxious to make up the losses he had experienced the previous winter when his ship Tiger had accidentally burned to the waterline at Manhattan. The trader and explorer was anxious, too, to secure the Dutch government's recent promise of a trading monopoly over any new countries or harbors discovered by Dutch explorers. Restless to turn his fortunes around, Block came up a river that was itself restless, running fresh and full of upriver snowmelt and spring rain. He named the river the Versha, meaning fresh as in fast running and as the first known European to probe its courses and seek its opportunities, he launched an era of restlessness that would change this river and its people forever. Then as now, restless had many meanings, and all would apply to the world the arrival of this little boat would create. A generation of Europeans, restless Europeans, both Dutch and English, constantly in motion, never ceasing or pausing, would come to the Connecticut, the place of the long water, first in search of trade with the indigenous people, and soon after in quest of those people's lands and resources. Some of them were spiritually restless, troubled in mind and soul, and seeking a place to serve their God as their consciences demanded. For the Native Americans already here, 
the arrival of the onrust heralded a new restlessness, first as they jostled to control distribution of European trade goods, and later as they fought the incoming insurgents' efforts to take their lands and control their lives. For Connecticut's first peoples, the arrival of the onrust brought centuries of restlessness, literal unrest, sleepless worry, sickness, turmoil, and death. Time is the acid rain of historical memory. Slowly, often over generations stretching into centuries, important details of the past can fade one by one until what was once crucial to the life of a time and people is all but forgotten. So it has been with the Dutch history of Connecticut. Most school children are still taught that the first European to come to Connecticut was Adrian Block and many students of Hartford history know the Dutch had a trading house there, somewhere close to the later site of Samuel Colt's arms manufacturing complex. But for the average Connecticut, that's the sum of it. The English arrived, and the Dutch faded to black. The rest of the colonial story, as they remember it, is a simplistic tale of English versus Indians that quickly morphs into one about patriots versus Tories. But that's not how it was. For its first 50 years, Connecticut was a restless, seething site of constant competition, pitting nation against nation, tribe against tribe, and colonies against colonies in a Rubik's Cube of combinations that always involved the Dutch. Nothing was done by the English at Connecticut without first calculating the Dutch response in New Netherland or at the States General, the seat of government in The Hague. No English settlement was expanded, no tribal alliance contracted, no trading venture launched without calculating the Dutch reaction. The Dutch Connecticut story was a deeply conflicted, sometimes harrowing experience. Those who lived in that time knew their lives depended on knowing it in great detail. <clears throat> now, I go on in this chapter to highlight the nearly continuous state of conflict between the various English plantations, Dutch authorities, and the Indian communities, and the shifting alliances that made life a restless and fearful struggle for everyone in Connecticut's first half century. It was a restless era that set the stage for much that came after, including Connecticut's unique history of witch hunting. In another chapter, I look at some of the issues that that history poses. Connecticut's record in handling witchcraft cases raises many questions. Some are unique to Connecticut. Some apply to all witch hunts. Why, for example, in the early years of witch hunting, 1647 to 1663, was Connecticut New England's fiercest prosecutor of witches? Why did it switch from being the region's greatest witch killer to the colony that ended executions permanently a generation before Salem? Why did people even believe in witchcraft? What exactly did people think witches could do, and why did it scare them so? Why were most witches women? What made someone who'd been a neighbor for many years suddenly so dangerous that community safety made their execution mandatory? The answer to these questions began not in Connecticut, but in Europe. And in the chapter, I trace the Renaissance history of witch hunting, explained the magical view of the world that made such hunts possible, and discuss the English witch hunts that were peaking when the Puritans emigrated to Connecticut. The Puritans who came to New England in the early decades of the 1600s carried their fear of the devil and his minions to Connecticut along with their Bible, clothing, and seed stock. England's greatest witch hunt took place between 1644 and 1647 in the Puritan counties of East Anglia. There, a man named Matthew Hopkins, who styled himself England's Witchfinder General, led a witch hunt that resulted in many executions. Some sources claim over 300. 
The East Anglian location of Hopkins witch hunt is significant. It's the place from which many of Connecticut's earliest settlers emigrated. They knew much about, and some had direct connections to, the Hopkins trials. Many must have feared that if the devil was assaulting the English Puritans that furiously in East Anglia, it was only a matter of time until he would find his way to New England. So it's not surprising, I think, that New England's first execution for witchcraft took place in 1647, just as the witch hunt in England was winding down. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this first New England witch death is that we wouldn't know anything about it except for two sentences that appeared in two different documents produced 100 miles away from each other and found some 250 years apart. Sometime between March and May of 1647, Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop, whose History Journal of New England is one of our most important historical sources from this period, wrote in that journal the following sentence. One blank of Windsor arraigned and executed at Hartford for a witch. Winthrop left the blank space intending, no doubt, to add the witch's name once he received further information. But for the next 257 years, that is all that was known. Some person who lived in Windsor was tried for witchcraft in Hartford and then executed. What was she charged with? Who conducted her trial? Who testified against her? What was her defense? Where was she hanged? None of this was known. In truth, historians did not even know whether New England's first convicted witch was a man or a woman. Then, in 1904, Annie Elliott Trumbull, daughter of Connecticut's first state librarian, announced that she had come into possession of a little old volume with a worn sheepskin binding that contained the manuscript diary of Matthew Grant, a resident of Windsor from 1635 to 1681. In it, she reported, she had found a Grant penned entry stating that on May 26, 1647, Alice Young was hanged. Finally, after two and a half centuries, it was confirmed that New England's first executed witch was, as supposed, a woman, and that her name was Alice Young. That remains most of what is known for certain about her, though historian Richard Ross has recently argued that Alice emigrated to Windsor from London in 1640, which may have put her culturally at odds with her Windsor neighbors, most of whom had emigrated from the English West Country. These cultural differences made her an outsider, Ross argues, which, combined with an epidemic of deadly influenza that hit Windsor the year of Young's execution, may have factored in her being singled out for prosecution. Now, this chapter goes on to detail Connecticut's record as early New England's fiercest prosecutor of witchcraft and how one man, Governor John Winthrop Jr., himself an alchemist and magic practitioner, intervened to bring witch executions in Connecticut to an end. It's a powerful story, I think, with a message just as important as any from the better-known Salem trials, and I think you might enjoy it. For the past decade, many Connecticuts, and especially our younger generation, have left our state to seek their fortunes elsewhere. This is truly troublesome, but it's not the first time it happened. In another chapter, I tell the story of the great outflux of young Connecticuts in the early 1800s as the dream or necessity of finding a better life took them to a part of Ohio known as the Connecticut Western Reserve. Here are a few passages that talk about their journeys west and their feelings about leaving. Connecticut in the early 19th century, as in the 21st century, was hemorrhaging its young people, the lifeblood of its future, to other more economically attractive locations. And it had been doing so for a long time. Although they dispersed to sites both far and near, 
One area in particular proved the most powerful magnet for Connecticut expatriates. This was the part of Northeast Ohio stretching 120 miles west from the Pennsylvania border, a place many people called New Connecticut, but which was also known and is today still called Connecticut's Western Reserve. This was a part of its original charter territory that Connecticut reserved ownership of when it ceded the remainder of its charter lands to the newly formed United States in 1786. The journey west was both long and hard, between 500 and 650 miles, depending on the route selected and the destination. Road conditions ranged from very bad to deplorable for most of the journey. In heavy rains, roads became mud pits and streams impassable. In some low-lying or wetland areas, efforts were made to ameliorate the muddy conditions by building corduroy roads of logs placed perpendicular to the direction of travel, which provided their own kind of jarring discomfort. It was an experience no traveler would ever forget. In addition to the considerable physical dangers of traveling bad roads, fording swelled streams and rivers, and climbing and descending high mountain passes, migrants commonly experienced inhospitable treatment at overcrowded and often squalid inns and taverns. They slept fitfully among strangers, ate bad food with rowdy, drunken, and sometimes dangerous fellow migrants, and fought off both homesickness and fear of the unknown. How did all these migrants feel about pulling up roots and leaving their native state? Some undoubtedly felt a pioneer's excitement at facing a world that was all possibility. Others, perhaps younger sons not in line to inherit a family farm, seethed with resentment about being forced into exile. And some, it is clear, saw having to leave Connecticut for the West as a sign of shame, a visible symbol that they were the expendable ones. How else can we explain Margaret Van Horn Dwight's comment on day two of her journey? The country we pass through till we are beyond New York, I need not describe to you, nor indeed could I, for I am attended by a very unpleasant, though not uncommon companion, one to whom I have bowed in subjection ever since I left you. Pride. It has entirely prevented me seeing the country, lest I should be known. And so I suppose it will attend me to the mountains then I am sure it will bid me adieu. Hiding in the wagon so she wouldn't be recognized. This is an aspect about migration that we almost never encounter and never think about. But once we see it, it complicates all those long-standing views of Anglos hot in the pursuit of manifest destiny. Surely, Connecticut's left their state with mixed emotions. But even as young Connecticuts were moving out of the state, others were moving in. Connecticut had found its future in harnessing its abundant water power to drive the factories of the Industrial Revolution, and that created an unprecedented need for workers to build a new kind of infrastructure. The Irish in Connecticut covers nearly 350 years of I the Irish story here, but I'd like to present three snapshots this evening. The first of what it was like for the Irish who arrived here in Connecticut in the years just before the potato famine of the mid-1840s. The second, what life was like for the children and grandchildren of those migrants a half century later, and then close out with just a quick glimpse of what it means to be an Irish Connecticut today. Enter the Irish. To meet the need for laborers, contractors for the Farmington Canal brought in 28 gangs of Irish canal workers called navvies from Galway and Cork. Hartford brought in 400 Irishmen for the Enfield Canal project. Life for the navvies was hellish. Like the Irish railroad trackers, track workers who soon followed them, they dug furiously sunup to sunset, 
goaded by overseer contractors whose profits depended on how much labor they could extract every day. Eyewitnesses marveled at the physical prowess of the Irishmen as they ran full wheelbarrows up narrow planks from ditches 20 feet deep. They lived in temporary shanty camps where overcrowding, poor sanitation, and stagnant water made disease a constant. Alcohol was woven into a workday marked by short bursts of furious digging followed by a trip to the whiskey barrel and a dram from the jigger boss. Irish workers were paid only for the day's weather and their health let them work, and they earned just 75 cents a day, one-third less than native-born laborers. The Navvies represented Connecticut's first major influx of practicing Irish Catholics, and the descendants of Connecticut's Puritan founders didn't like that at all. Connecticut had no resident priests, and the Yankees made it clear that that was just fine with them. When the Reverend John Powers of New York requested permission to celebrate Mass for canal workers at New Haven's Protestant Seamen's Chapel on Long Wharf, he was told, we have no popery in New Haven and we don't want any. Despite this overt intolerance, popery did come to Connecticut, at first through the services of an itinerant priest from Rhode Island, who in 1828 conducted house masses on the east bank of the river in Hartford. The following year, Hartford became home to Most Holy Trinity, Connecticut's first Catholic church. The newspaper, the Connecticut Observer, was aghast. How will it read in history that in 1829, Hartford in the state of Connecticut was made the center of a Roman Catholic mission? Well, let's jump forward a half century and see how the children and grandchildren of those very unwanted first comers are doing. Unlike their fathers, by 1900, two-thirds of second-generation Irish men worked in skilled trades or higher, with economic security mirroring that of the Connecticut Yankees. Irish-American men dominated police and fire departments and monopolized the building trades. And, while 90% of their mothers remained domestic servants, second-generation Irish-American daughters rose to become clerks, skilled factory workers, teachers, and union organizers, too. Better jobs came in part because of high Irish involvement in Connecticut's labor movement. Irish Americans made up most of many unions' membership and leadership. <clears throat> Let's close out by looking at what it's like to be an Irishman in Connecticut today. To be Irish in Connecticut in the 21st century is, for those lucky enough to claim Irish-American ancestry, a source of both identity and pride, underscored by an extraordinary long-term record of Irish Connecticut's achievements in politics, law, public safety, commerce, industry, and culture. The fact that such achievements were made by a people once reviled as incapable, discriminated against as inferior, and treated as unwelcome interlopers in a society that took offense at their very presence, is an important reminder, especially in times like this, that the very people we fear at one moment can sometimes turn out to be the source of some of our society's greatest strengths. Well, I'm sure you all would agree with me that Connecticut's most important cultural icon, and we have so many in this state, but the most important one of all is the Gilded Age author and satirist Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. His historic home museum in Hartford is also one of the country's great historic landmarks. And, you know, it's, I think it's kind of wonderful that Connecticut is home to two great Mark Twain houses, one in Reading and one here in Hartford. 
the home in Hartford, which you know, tens of thousands of people visit every year, uh, is one of the great historic sites to see in this country. In Mark Twain and the Historic House Problem, I come right out and ask the question I think everyone asks when they visit that house of this great, great man. Of course, they're too diffident or too polite to ask the question, but I'm sure they're thinking of it. I, I don't hesitate. I just walk right up to the docent or the volunteer, and I, I just put it out there. Why can't I smell smoke? Twain was no ordinary smoker. He was a deeply committed, unregenerate, professional pipe and cigar smoker who mastered his craft at an early age and continued to improve upon it for the next 68 years. In the great age of industrial production, Twain turned himself into a literary factory, belching cigar smoke as the words poured forth. Wherever Twain went, tobacco smoke followed, and one of his greatest fears was to be where tobacco wasn't. In 1867, one day before sailing to Honolulu from British Columbia, Twain found a local wholesale tobacconist and bought 3,000 cheroots, those are small cigars, and 15 pounds of tobacco. That was about one cigar per nautical mile of the impending voyage. Now, later that afternoon, he went back and bought 3,000 more cheroots. And that night, shortly after beginning a farewell public lecture, Twain stopped the talk in midstream. He called his manager up to the stage, and he said, Pond, I fear that cigar place may close before I get through here. Go there now and get 1,500 more of those cheroots. In the morning, Twain and his 7,500 cigars plus his tobacco happily embarked for the Sandwich Islands. Now, Twain knew smoking was generally unhealthy, but he saw the habit as a kind of life vest that provided a wellness safety margin. He told the story of the doctor who visited an 80-year-old woman who was in rapidly failing health. You must stop drinking, he told her. I never touched a drop of alcohol in my life, she answered. Then you must immediately give up smoking, the doctor said. I have never ever smoked, she said indignantly. Well then, the doctor replied, there's no way I can help you. You are a sinking ship with no freight to throw overboard. Well, I suspect most people would agree that elections in recent years, at least some of them, have left people on both sides of the political aisle with something of a bad taste in their mouths. And that's why this might be a good time to revive one of our state's oldest and for centuries most time-honored traditions, the Connecticut election cake. What's an election cake and why is it a Connecticut tradition? An election cake was a big, rich fruit, spice, and sugar yeast cake baked up in huge quantities and served to all comers during the festivities surrounding first our colonies and later our state's annual elections. The story of how election cake became a Connecticut tradition goes all the way back to the days of the Puritans. One of the things that made the Puritans so pure was that they didn't believe in the annual round of Catholic and Anglican holidays. They didn't celebrate Christmas or Easter or any of the numerous saints and festival days, and for them, New Year's Day came on March 25th, so no midnight kisses or dropping ball either. Well, while they rejected all of those supposedly invented occasions for mirth, they did believe that in the year 1662, Connecticut, for reasons still not exactly clear, got something that very much was worth celebrating, a royal charter from King Charles II that gave the Connecticut colony virtual independence more than a century before the American Revolution. Unlike Massachusetts and Virginia and the other royally governed American colonies, Connecticut could make its own laws, and more important, 
elect its own leaders without royal oversight. This right to choose their own leaders was seen from the start as fundamentally important and distinctive, worth celebrating and worth protecting. So it's not surprising that on those days when Connecticuts gathered to choose their leaders, back then Election Day took place in early May, these otherwise celebration-starved Puritans found reason to celebrate, and what better way to do so than with cake and lots of it. We know Connecticuts were feasting on Election Day cakes well before the American Revolution because the colonial records tell us so. In May 1771, for example, uh, the General Assembly approved a bill for two pounds, seven shillings, and nine pence to pay for the election cakes. And if incorporating election cake into the ceremonies was an important Connecticut tradition before the American Revolution, it became even more important after. As Connecticuts themselves spread across the country to the new lands in the American West, the election cake tradition went with them. Election cake recipes appear in early cookbooks in states across the nation, and they are abundantly found in the manuscript cookbooks left by individuals in our historical societies and archives. Reading these works, a few things become crystal clear. Election cakes were central to the election rituals in many places, but especially here in Connecticut and making an extraordinary election cake, perhaps with a special ingredient or a unique mixing process to read about these recipes. It really is. It's, it's intense kitchen chemistry. It became a point of honor with many homekeepers. Having a reputation for making a delicious election cake became a very competitive source of status. During the 1800s, as Connecticut industrialized, welcomed people from many new nations, broke its official ties to the old Puritan church, and experienced the sectional divide that led to the American Civil War, some of Connecticut's time-honored Election Day traditions, like riding out to meet the new governor as he made his way into the Capitol, or parading behind the state's ministers to hear an election sermon in the first congregational church, these fell by the wayside, but the election cake remained a steady and delicious habit. When the General Assembly decided in 1876 to change the start of its sessions from May to early January, beginning in 1877, a journalist lamenting the switch of election day to midwinter said, the coming collection parade of May 1876 is likely to be the last that will take place in Connecticut. Though the sermon has gone out, though the parade is going out, though the whole institution may become an element of the past, one feature of it will always remain, and that is the election cake. Lovers of it, when it's just right, say no other cake equals it. It's only necessary to add that nobody can make it but a Connecticut housekeeper and that each housekeeper and her circle of adherents know that she can make it a good deal better than any of her rivals. Now, perhaps this is exactly the right time for the Connecticut election cake to make its comeback. At this moment, when American politics seems so divisive and so bitter, wouldn't it be great if a cohort of culinary Connecticuts men and women equally this time, join together to use their ovens to remind people that democracy, this right to choose the people who rule our government, is a sweet privilege indeed. And what better way could there be to celebrate sweet democracy than to bring back the tradition of the Connecticut election cake? Now, I'm, I'm really serious about this. I've been, I've been promoting the election cake idea I did a couple of months before the last election. I'm certainly going to do it going into the next one. And I would love to recruit you to join me in uh, this Sweet Democracy project. I have put a modernized election cake recipe in the book, but far be it from me to, to uh, try to make you get the book, to get this recipe. 
in, in a minute or so, I'm going to put up on the screen my email address at UConn. And uh, it's easy to remember. It's walt at uconn.edu. It is the easiest and shortest email address at the entire university. And if you will write to me and just say, I'd like an election cake recipe, I will send you a modernized, uh, easy to bake recipe for an election cake and ask you in turn that if you bake it, share it with a friend, you know, or share it with someone you know who doesn't share your political beliefs and sit down and don't talk politics, talk about the process and how wonderful it is to live in a country where you actually can pick your own leaders. Well, that's my hope anyway. Um, and I would very happily send you a copy of the election cake recipe. So there it is. That's an overview of the stories in Creating Connecticut. And I have to say that what I've presented is only a sampler. In addition, there are stories on the rough justice meted out by the British to Connecticut state hero Nathan Hale during the American Revolution. And then there's a, a really nice story about 1935's pull out all the stops 300th anniversary of Connecticut's founding the biggest celebration ever in this state's history. I tell the inspiring, to me anyway, 275-year-old story of the Lyman family's whatever-it-takes devotion to make and keep Lyman orchards a thriving Connecticut farm. I've got a story about the Puritans' only art form, which was, not surprisingly, gravestone carving, and... I have a profile of Irish-born Governor John Dempsey, who was the only immigrant govern governor of Connecticut since the colonial era. And there's a meditation on just what it is that makes Connecticut such a unique state. And that, of course, is just a sampler. I hope you like uh, what you've heard enough to want to read more, and if you do, that you'll Come to the Mark Twain Library and check out a copy of Creating Connecticut. Uh, pick one up at your local bookstore. You can get it for a great price right now on Amazon.com. And if you would like a signed copy, I would certainly be happy to send you one posting and sales tax included. Uh, it just write to me at this address or call me at this number and I'll be happy to arrange to get that done. What is most important to me is what I talked about at the very beginning. I wrote this book to entice, to interest, hopefully to encourage people to re-engage with the wonderful and fascinating history of this state that still in so many ways is shaping our lives in uh, very tangible and sometimes less noticeable ways every single day. That's why I wrote Creating Connecticut, and that's why I'm so thankful to have had the chance to present uh, this sampler to you and why I am so very appreciative that you took the time to uh, tune in and listen. So with that done, I will happily, uh, I will give you back the screen. I'll turn it over to Elaine. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So Elaine, are you back? Yes. Excellent. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, Walt, thank you. That was very fun, very enticing. I think we are all excited to learn more about Connecticut. And I want to bake one of those cakes. So I'm looking forward to that. It's really good. It sounds like it. So I, I look forward to getting the recipe. But we do have a couple questions. Um, can you tell us why Salem, uh, Salem, Massachusetts is the place in America known for witch trials, while Connecticut's witch trials really are seldom heard of. You know, there are, there are, uh, of course, the reason would be a Connecticut, wouldn't it? And <laughs> much of it has to do with Salem getting much better press. And in the past century, that press has come from a Roxbury playwright named Arthur Miller whose play The Crucible is based on the Salem witch, witchcraft trials. 
it is a story that is still, I think, a high school staple in many places, you know, a high school performance staple. And you know, the, the truth of the matter is, Salem always got better press. Massachusetts always got better press. But the action I have, you know, I've maintained from the beginning has really been in Connecticut. And if you read the story about witchcraft, I, I actually wrote another book uh, that has a, a, you know, it's an academic book, but it really goes into the background of these Connecticut witch trials and this story of ending witchcraft uh, executions a whole generation before Salem. And it's just, it is a truly fascinating story. Thank you. Um, also, do you know the origins of our state's nickname, the Nutmeg State? The Nutmeg State? Oh, I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I do. And I, I, I get to ask this question a lot. And I really like it. I, I'll, I'll try to give you the shorthand version because this is one I can really go on about. In, in, in the late 18th century and early 19th century, as Connecticut was beginning to industrialize, a lot of the things that were being made in these early Connecticut factories were useful household items. And so what would happen is that in the fall and winter, uh, gregarious Connecticut farm boys, the ones with, you know, who, who really wanted to get adventuresome young men with a sense of spirit and a gift of gab, they would often uh, take carts or trunks or sometimes even wagons and load them up with these Connecticut produced goods, thimbles, scissors, uh, candlesticks, lights, all kinds of useful things. And they would leave Connecticut after the harvest was in, head north, south, east, west, sometimes as far as South America, and they would be Yankee peddlers for the winter. And one of the things they would take with them because Connecticut had a thriving trade with the West Indies, was nutmeg. Nutmeg only grows in two places in the world. One is in the West Indies and the other is in, uh, 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 I'm, I'm gonna get this wrong, maybe Madagascar, but it only grows in two places. And nutmeg as a spice was incredibly useful because it, w it was very good, not only for the purposes we use it for, but also for masking the flavor of meat that was beginning to turn. So in the years before refrigeration, you can imagine nutmeg was a highly desired. It was, it was a high value product for these peddlers to take for, you know, ounce for ounce, nutmegs were probably the best product they carried. And what some of these, uh, some of these really skillful, sociable Yankee peddlers realized was that at night, if when they were sitting around the campfire, they just took their, their pen knives and took some wood and whittled out some nutmeg looking wooden, you know, nuts and put them in the middle of the tins of nutmeg, they could increase their profits exponentially. And they said, no one will find it because they won't get to the middle of the tent till long after I'm gone. So they got a reputation for selling wooden nutmegs. But the story that was told is that these guys were so likable and you so look forward to their coming that when you found out they had, they had uh, you know, you'd been taken with a wooden nutmeg, you laughed it off because you just kind of remembered them as plucky Yankees. Now, that is, and, and from that, Connecticut got this reputation for, you know, being inventive, for being, for being great businessmen, but maybe not completely on the up and up. And that's how we got to be the nutmeg state. And I will tell you, at the turn of the 20th century, some of the uh, Gilded Age socialites in uh, notably in Hartford, but elsewhere around the state, launched a furious campaign to change the name of the nutmeg state. Uh, they, you know, they, they really said, this is just terrible for our reputation. We have to move it. They advanced the Constitution state, which didn't become the official 
uh, nickname of the state until the 1950s. But, and that's my short version. Imagine how long the long version is. Thank you. No, that was very interesting. AJ bets that the nutmeg um, must be in the election cake recipe. You know, I, uh, I, I don't remember if it is, but it, it, it may be all spice, but it certainly is. It will fit perfectly in it. So if you have nutmeg, let that be your special ingredient and your, the way you achieve high status as an election cake baker. <laughs> Very good. Um, Liz says, thank you, and also wants to know, does your book include stories of indigenous people are free and enslaved back black people in Connecticut and their role in the Atlantic world? It does indeed. The, the, uh, many of the early stories, the, the, the chapter about the Dutch mm -hmm. is really an extended story about these early colonial interactions. There's another story on Weathersfield, and it, the chapter is called Weathersfield's War, but it really is about the relationships between the Wangunk people, the Pequot Nation, and the English in the early years of settlement. There is a chapter on uh, Samson Ockham and Eliezer Wheelock. Eliezer Wheelock founded uh, in Eastern Connecticut, Moore's Indian Charity School to train uh, uh, indigenous people in Connecticut to be Christian missionaries to their own people. He did it based on uh, his success in educating a Mohegan, a young Mohegan man named Samson Ockham. And uh, there, the chapter, this led to the founding of Dartmouth College but it also led to a great rift between Ockham and Wheelock. It's a fascinating story of, you know, a moment when there might have been, uh, there might have been a, a real hope of kind of a cultural accommodation that failed. There are, there are also, there's a story about Henry Green. There's a story, Henry Green was a formerly enslaved African American who came to Hartford with uh, Lincoln's Secretary of War Gideon Wells at the end of the Civil War and about his life here. There is a, a, another chapter about abolition uh, or actually Connecticut's very slow walk towards abolition. It's a, it is a reminder that uh, for all our progressive values today, they are more newfound than uh, steady habits. Thank you. Uh, how did you decide on Connecticut, 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 can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Connecticut's. <laughs> yes. As I, the term for use as a person from Connecticut, as opposed to Connecticut. -ter. Connecticut is, I, well, I, this, this is a wonderful story. I should write this up because I have never, I've never written this story down, but I think it's wonderful. I, uh, although I, I I was born in Europe, my father's family is from here. I lived in Europe till I was ten, but we would come to Connecticut every summer. And uh, and Connecticut, this town I live in now, actually was my vision of America, and it was a place I always wanted to live. Um, so so being Connecticut always was special to me. And when I became the state historian, that was a kind of dream, uh, my history dream come true. And uh, I had settled into the job and heard people calling us kinetic cutters. And I thought, oh my God, you know, did, did, everything's wrong with that name. It's too long. You know, this idea that we're cutters, not good, just something's got to give. And I thought to myself, one of the things I would like to work at while I am state historian is moving away from that name. And I thought about, Okay, what's a Connecticut is not easy to kind of create a, uh, a if you if you would a slang term for, but I thought about how other states do it, and I thought about Ohio ands, Nebraskans, Kansans. Why can't we be Connecticuts? So my little subversive attempt at bringing change to Connecticut, the land of steady habits, was to decide shortly after I became state historian that I would talk about Connecticut and hope that by osmosis it seeped in. 
What I didn't know is that at almost exactly the same moment, Elizabeth Norman, who was a, had a publisher in Hartford who had gotten an idea of creating a history magazine called Connecticut Explored. It started out as the Hog River Journal. And she had reached the exact same conclusion and independently come up with the same name. So she started writing about Connecticut's in her magazine. 15 years later, or longer than that even, uh, Connecticut Explored is still writing about Connecticut's. I am still writing about Connecticut's and talking about Connecticut's, and we are now seeing it, you know, appear all around the state. So, so you know, this is, I, I hope, if I leave any legacy at all, it'll be, you know, a, a simplified word change. Very good. Um, uh, so have... please join me in saying Connecticut's because it's, we'll, we'll cut Connecticut or, and let people know con Connecticut can. Sorry, enough, bad pun. We'll move on. Very good. We'll help you with that task. Um, Carol would like to know, she says, have you written about the Gillette family? Or original owner of the Nook Farm in Connecticut. I've always, I'm always interested in any relationship between the Gillette family, the Twain family, and the H.B. Stowe family. I know yeah, that yeah. Mark Twain supported William Gillette at the startup of his career. You know, that actually, I have written about the Gillette family, but it's usually been in the, con I've written about it in, I have a website todayinCTHistory.com, which is a companion piece to the Today in Connecticut History uh, short program I do on on public radio during the week. And on this site every day, I, I would really welcome you all to visit it. And if you like what you see, subscribe. And we will send you every morning a short email that'll let you know something really interesting that happened in Connecticut that day. On Today in Connecticut History, I have several entries about William Gillette, uh, his career as an actor and an interpreter of Sherlock Holmes, and also Gillette Castle. But I haven't, uh, I haven't gone back before that and talked about Nook Farm. But it strikes me that would be, excuse me, a very interesting topic to take up. So thank you very much. And we do have a few minutes left, and there was one last question about the Lyman um, Orchard. And you said, do you have just a minute to tell us a, a tidbit from that story? Oh, there, you know, this, this is really, it's, this is a wonderful, I, I have such admiration for this family that from the beginning has tied themselves to this one block, well, to many blocks of land, but the center is the family farm in Middlefield. And in order to keep this farm productive through, you know, many periods of uh, uh, economic duress, they've become inventors, they've developed products, they, you know, the, they become washing machine manufacturers, but always it's been the heart of this farm. And, and David Lyman and his son, this is around, Lyman's around the 1830s and 1840s, were fierce abolitionists. And in 1850, after the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, this law offended so many Northerners because it said, it made it the law of the land that you had to help a Southern slave catcher come and retrieve any, any enslaved person who had escaped to the North. So it essentially forced or putatively would force any New Englander to help an enslaver recover his so-called property. New Englanders were incensed at this, but very few people publicly spoke out David Lyman and his son risked everything to publish a newspaper story in Middlefield uh, condemning this action. And for that reason, the Lyman family home at Lyman Orchards in Middlefield is on the Connecticut Freedom Trail and also on the National Historic Register. 
it is, it, you know, it's a genuine story of, of courage at a, you know, that the, the, the courage to stand up and speak when everyone else is keeping it to themselves is, uh, you know, that's, that's a rare and honorable thing to do. It sounds like an inspirational story. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Walter. We really appreciate it. It's been very enlightening and delightful to hear well, all Well, thank you. you so much, everyone. I really, you know, close the windows. I know it's hot, then it'll be cooler tomorrow, but it's been booming here. I don't know if you could hear it in the background, but uh, yeah. we've but been getting a lot of storms and I'm going to, I have a very scared dog who is over in the corner shaking. So I'm going to go pick her up and tell yeah. her everything's okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you tonight. Take care.